Welcome everyone. Um, today I am so excited. Uh, we have an incredible guest. Her name is Michelle Karen. Welcome. Thank you, Maiti. I'm so excited to be here with you all. I am so excited to have you. Thank you so much for making for making the time. Um, I don't know where to start with you. I mean, I can mention about a professional astrologer, master degree in philosophy, a trained actress and model, degree in hatha yoga, a volunteer with free arts for abused children, uh, a regular newspaper and magazine contributor. Um, you have client, uh, clientele over 79 countries in five continents. Um, we use astrology, tarot cards, numerology, uh, along your um, abilities, uh, psychic abilities. Um, she's also a global citizen um, and has written how many books? <laughs> Uh, something like eight or nine, I think, at this point. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to check myself. <laughs> so I just would invite you to maybe start sharing a little about yourself or whatever you feel called to share with us today, and then we'll see what comes. So thank you, Maite. So I'm actually an astrologer and a shaman. These are my two main uh, my two mm -hmm. main activities. Uh, I started astrology when I was 14 years old. I read a book uh, by Linda Goodman, um, Linda Goodman's Sun Signs. And I told my parents I was going to be an astrologer. And they're like, what? She's 14. What the hell is she talking about? And they didn't even know what this was. And they had no idea. And they didn't even think it was a career. So they said, OK, whatever. She's 14. She's get, going to get over it. Well, I didn't. <laughs> And uh, when I was, uh, I finished high school, you know, I was going to the French, um, to the French uh, Lycée, Lycée Francais uh, in Washington, D.C. My father was a journalist, so we traveled a lot. We were changing countries pretty much every three years. But uh, I continued my studies through the French system. And when I finished the baccalaureate, uh, my parents said, so what do you want to do now? And I said, well, I told you already <laughs> three years ago. <laughs> And now they freaked out. They completely freaked out. So they made me get a master's degree in philosophy, which I did. I, I didn't care in what, basically, but I did philosophy because that felt the closest to what I was interested in. And um, I've been an astrologer all my life. And, um, and then, um, you know, I started giving conferences. I started giving talks. I started having a clientele, giving classes. Um, I started traveling on my own when my parents stopped because I was so used to it that that has been a constant in my life. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, shamanism came into my life, which had always been there actually, because I was raised, I was born in Finland. My father was Finnish, my mother French. I was born in Finland and you know, no matter where we lived in the world, my father always insisted for us to spend the summers in Finland. And the summers in Finland, it's like you are by a lake or a river, you are on an island or you are in the forest, uh, you live wildly because of the midnight sun, which actually this is one of the representations, this is a Ruyu from Finland, and it's one of the representations of the reflection of the midnight sun in the lakes. As you probably know, there are like a thousand thousands of lakes in Finland it's like a big Swiss cheese kind of country <laughs> with lakes everywhere mm -hmm. um, and uh, and little uh, you know sort of little islands and lots of forests and pretty much a whole population lives in Helsinki so the rest of Finland you can drive for days and not see a soul uh, so nature is very prominent uh, and that was where I was living that's where I grew up um, in this nature, surrounded by nature, walking barefoot in the forest, uh, 
picking up berries and eating those berries. And that gave me this understanding of the earth and nature as a living entity where the trees live, the rocks live, where everything has a message for us. So the jump to shamanism was so natural for me because that's how I had been raised and that was part of my own roots and cultures. So it was very simple when I met the Kero shamans in Peru, when they saw me as the reincarnation of the Inca princess, as the uh, reincarnation of the most powerful um, you know, Sha woman in Atlantis. Uh, and they started initiating me as a result of recognizing these reincarnations. Um, wow. It was wow. just natural. It was like I was back in my world that I had never really understood as systematically as what they taught me. But then it became very clear that I had been doing these things in a natural way pretty much all my life. Mm. Oh my goodness, fascinating and how beautiful that you could be trained and, and exposed to that. How, how wonderful. So, um, but it's very funny because, you know, when the Kiros train you, it's not like they say, okay, now we're going to train you. You know, it doesn't quite work like that. It's more like, um, because it all started with a head-on train collision in the jungle on the 24th of December. And uh, that was about 15 years ago, I believe. Yes, we had mm -hmm. that 15 years ago. And, um, and uh, the friend I was traveling with had three broken ribs, so he could not, you know, really be very active. But I had nothing, which was also very strange because I was standing in the train at the time of the collision and i thought wow they break very in a very rough way here <laughs> um yeah. and but i had nothing i didn't have a scratch i didn't have anything so during the weeks that followed uh every time i left the hotel there was a care waiting for me outside the hotel and i thought it was normal you know i mean what did i know it was my first time in this lifetime in peru i mean i I thought it was normal. Uh, and I realized later on that it really wasn't because the Kiros are not necessarily welcome. They're not even necessarily recognized by the population. So there was this sense that, um, you know, of something exciting, but at the same time, I didn't think it was extraordinary. And a lot of my life is like that, <laughs> you know, that things happen and I thought it was normal. And then in retrospect, I realized, no, it wasn't. <laughs> it was actually very much ordained. And, and it was like I was uh, in a sort of plan that I didn't consciously plan and yet unfolded in a very organic manner. So they were there and they would take me places, they would do ceremonies, they would do things, they were studying. And, and I didn't realize until three months later when I returned to the US, I was living in Arizona already at the time. Uh, I've been pretty much going between Arizona and uh, California. I lived in LA a long time where I was the astrologer to the movie stars at the 76th Academy Awards. That was also a funny story how that happened. Um, but anyway, the, um, um, and then when I returned to Arizona, I realized I was not the same person. I had physically changed. Um, I had a very hard time returning to civilization, um, even though we were living in a hotel, but uh, I had been in nature, in the temples, interacting with the Kiros almost every day. And that was, um, you know, it, it was like I, I was changed, I was different. I mm -hmm. was connecting to my truth at a deeper level. And a lot of things started to shed in me. A lot of things started to, um, to transform, even though I had worked on myself my whole life. I mean, I was, even though I started when I was 14 being an astrologer, before that I was a medium as a child, uh, before that, so I didn't have this, awakening you know one day i woke up and i had this awakening i was always the way i am i'm just more 
anchored and more solid and more grounded in what I have always been. But it was never, I, I can't uh, recall of a time where I had a, a, a shift, a major shift in consciousness. It was a gradual thing, even though, of course, meeting the carols was very profound. Uh, reading this uh, Linda Goodman book was absolutely life changing. So there has been some people on my path that have definitely changed the course of my destiny or more rather have anchored my destiny. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So how, what, how do you define shamanism and what do you think can bring, can bring into our lives nowadays? Uh, that is such a difficult question. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, so you know why I laugh? Because every time I'm, I'm asked this question on radio and television and I give the answer I'm going to give you, I'm never invited again. <laughs> So, because really what it is, it is the indigenous psychotherapy using rocks, feathers, and rattles. I love it. <laughs> so, yeah, so usually, I mean, you, you may say you're very conscious, so you're not going to laugh at me, but usually if I'm interviewed by somebody who's not so conscious, they look at me like, whatever, you know? <laughs> How can you do psychotherapy with rocks? Well, you do. You take a rock and you focus on things that are difficult in your life and you blow into the rock. And then there's specific things you can do with a rock. A lot of things. You'd be amazed what you can do with rocks and feathers. You'd be amazed, really. So it's about really um, understanding that nature is our healer. You know, the Kiros call nature Pachamama. It's Mother Earth. And they're always talking about Pachamama and they're always honoring Pachamama. Like they never drink before putting a few drops of their drink onto the earth. They sleep on the ground. They don't want a mattress. They don't want, and they have beautiful cloths that, you know, hand-woven cloths. They don't even really use that because they want to be hugging their mother. No Kero has a dysfunctional family because their true father is, the Apus, the mountains, and their true mother is Pachamama, Mother Earth. So it's very beautiful because when you start to be in that consciousness, uh, you realize that whatever issues you have, and we all have them, nobody's perfect. We will, probably wouldn't be here if we were, um, but we, we can solve those issues by going back to nature, by by um, honoring nature. And that's a big difference between shamanism and magic, is that in magic, there is a lurking after a specific outcome. In shamanism, we are constantly tracking, constantly listening, listening to the trees, listening to the river, listening to the animals. You know, whatever animal crosses our path one day, it has a meaning. Um, and I love this whole period of confinement has actually allowed nature to come more forward. I'm woken up in the morning by, you know, hundreds of birds and I've had rabbits and raccoons and lizards and iguanas and all these animals have been, um, have been coming into my garden. <laughs> um, and that is, and they all have a message and not coming by accident. Like I have a little family of quails and that's so adorable. Mm -hmm. So there's other quail, there's a four little baby quails that are running around and are like so tiny. And there's the father quail who's actually limping. He has a little limp. So I recognize him all the time because he limps a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's just so beautiful to see them living. And the other day there was this, these sparrows that were around my, my backyard. And I have a little bath, you know, bird bath thing with a little, you know, waterfall. And, um, and somehow it had fallen in a corner and they were like all with each other discussing how they could get to the waterfall and take a shower. But it was like an engineering meeting of the little sparrows around the bird bath. It was so adorable. So, but all this has meaning, you know, all these animals carry a message and they are speaking to us. 
and that's the magic is that we keep learning all the time like in shamanism it's you know i call my i have a school i started a school that the carols forced me to start actually it was their idea not mine because <laughs> um a lot of things in my life i would be very happy just reading under a tree <laughs> Um, I was a bit of the, rec the, 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 how do you say, recalcitrant in French, uh, the, um, you know, the one who doesn't want to do things. Um, the, how do you say in, in English? The word is not coming to me, but, um, and they really forced me to start teaching. And now I have this school, the Yankai Muna Yachai School of Shamanic Studies in Phoenix, Arizona, and in Helsinki in Finland. Um, and uh, I call this the Harry Potter school <laughs> because that's pretty much what it is. You never know what you're going to encounter. You never know what's going to happen. You never know what uh, we are going to be dealing with. And that's the, the, the enchantment of it, you know, the, 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 the joy of it, that now is the time. And especially now, I think shamanism is more important than ever because a lot of us have, roots in shamanism have been shamans in previous lives and now is this time where we need to remember our roots reconnect with mother earth reconnect with our true nature and when the heroes were asked about this time and what is going on and why all this drama in the world and this virus and all these things you know the their method of divination is to throw coca leaves so they cycled throwing the coca leaves and what they saw in the coca leaves was that the three worlds the underworld the middle world where we live and the upper world of masters angels archangels are literally collapsing into each other right now which is really pretty much the end times and that there are two paths, the path of those who just want to ignore all of that, have fun and live completely disconnected, their hearts from their, their, their heads. Um, and those are not going to have a good time at all. It's going to become rockier and rockier and more and more difficult. Whereas those who are honoring Mother Earth, those who are working on themselves, those who are in harmony with nature are going to have a better and better life and are going to go to eternal life. Which actually, in a very magnificent way, echoes what the Prophecy Rock in Mesa, Arizona has been speaking about for all these uh, centuries. Uh, nobody really knows you know, who did it, but it does go back definitely to the, uh, at, uh, to the Hopi Indians at least. And it's the same, it's this drawing on the rock, uh, very with two pathways, great spirit is there, there is a square that represents the, the portal, a cosmic portal, which I take to believe to represent 2012 and the end of the Mayan calendar and, and uh, what happened cosmically at that time. And from there, there were two paths. Either we honor Mother Earth, we, we respect nature, we respect animals, we respect trees. Uh, we listen to the wisdom of nature. We listen to our own bodies. We respect our own bodies as temples. Or we just want to have fun. We don't care. We just abuse the earth. We, we just don't um, honor our own roots and we completely are out of integrity. We don't, our hearts and our minds do not connect and, and that's it. And that's unfortunately the path that goes, that, and it's shown on that prophecy rock as the path that becomes like rockier and rockier. It's like steps and then all of a sudden the steps go nowhere. And whereas the one on the bottom where there's less people, but they are honoring and growing corn and nurturing and living in the sense of abundance are going to eternal life. And this is where so, we are right now. It's so fascinating what you are saying and the synchronicities is incredible. Yesterday I was having an interview with Richard Rudd, uh, Dean Keeps. I don't know if you have heard about him. Yes, and I have, yes. And uh, he, I believe, I don't know if I am going to give the right name, but I think he called it trilogy or like three specific years that 
uh, established some kind of shipment in, in humanity. And he talks, I believe, about uh, 2012 and how we as human have, you know, the option to decide which way are we taking and based on that, what are we becoming in the future. And, you know, or, or even nowadays, you know, what conscious steps we take into, the, into what we have right now. By the way, before I go to the next question, this one is from Machu Picchu. <laughs> oh, I love you. That's beautiful. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yes, yeah, it brings so many good memories from there, and I, I love that land, so it's very special. So I love to hear everything that you're saying. And, and it's so amazing because you know before I went to Machu Picchu, I mean I was 16 years old. We were living. My father was, um, you know, a journalist, so he was following world events, and we were, you know, going with the world events around the world. Um, so we were living in Washington D.C., and I saw a picture of Machu Picchu, and I fell in a trance for three days. So I've never touched the drugs, ayahuasca, none of that. Okay, I don't do that. The curves don't do ayahuasca. Um, that's not my path at all. Uh, I don't drink. I don't, I've never taken any kind of substance because I don't believe it's necessary. I believe we can, if we meditate, we live in a healthy way. We can absolutely reach amazing states of consciousness and there's no need for any of that, which has a price to pay. Actually, our yes guys, well, and don't get me started on that because <laughs> that's maybe not a good idea. <laughs> but um, but anyway, that's how that's how it started. And I thought, you know, Peru was Machu Picchu. That was it. And when I finally was able to go there, I realized the whole land is like that. It's like there's millions of temples, there's millions of magical places in Peru, and it's not just Machu Picchu. That's certainly an amazing um, landmark. Uh, but there are many, 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 many more, uh, and there's so much mystery. You know, people always ask me, why do you keep going back to Peru? Because I've been going like once, twice a year for the past 16 years now. Um, and because every time I go, I discover something new. Every time I go, I meet somebody else. Every time I go, there's another legend that emerges, and those legends are stories we have forgotten the truth of. And it's so exciting to me. It's like a, it's like a, an onion country. <laughs> Finland is the same for me, actually. It's an onion country. It's like every time you go, there's another layer and another layer and another layer. And, um, and it's a country that has so much magic that you can never fully, you know, get to the bottom of all of it because it keeps expanding. And, and, that, and it keeps expanding as your own consciousness expands and it, at the same time it accompanies the expansion of your own consciousness. And I love, I mean, the Kiros also made me take groups to Peru, which was not my idea at all. So actually it started with one person. I said, okay, 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 I'll do it. One person, I said, perfect, refunded, not doing it. I tried, didn't work. And then they were still on my back with that. So the next uh, group, I had five people. And, <laughs> and I said, okay, not enough. So I'm going to cancel again. And this one guy from Switzerland said, Michelle, you can't cancel the trip. I bought my shoes. I'm like, what? Um, so we ended up, I ended up doing this trip for five people. And then it never stopped after that. Yeah, you, <laughs> you know, the joy. Sorry? You offer mystical trips, right? I think you offer yes. them to Peru, Bolivia, yes. Finland, Egypt, Bosnia. Like, you have a few. <laughs> yes. Uh, so my signature trip until now has been Peru, Bolivia, uh, which I've been doing every year. Uh, and my next one is in November 2020. I only take 20 people, 22 at the most, because I don't want large groups. And it's always exciting for me to rediscover Peru through uh, the eyes of people who have never been there. So I love that trip because I really, and we are all in the same bars, the same hotel. That's why I want smaller groups so that we are really together and we're not, you know, um, spread out and, and all of that. And, um, and then I started bringing also people to Finland because that was my enchanted land where I was born. I'm half Finnish. 
uh, but I've lived most of my life outside of Finland. So I have both an inside view and an outside view. So it was, and there's so much magic also in Finland. It's a very un explored uh, country with amazing shamanic roots like the Kalevala which is the old uh, ancient books uh, book of the Finns the epic story of the Finns based on the runes that were sung in the old houses in the winter the long winter the 10 months winter um, that was uh, that was uh, collected by um, Elias Lonrut in um, at the beginning of the 19th century who uh, uh, no 20th century who was a um, who was a doctor and who was realizing that all these people were dying who were chanting those runes so he put them all together into the book that became the Kalevala and that actually gave um, Finland its national identity just a little over a hundred years ago so it's very recent and the Kalevala a lot of people don't know that is at the base of the Lord of the Rings um, because Tolkien was fascinated by this book and that inspired him or at least was one of the major inspirations for the Lord of the Rings and also inspired um, the um, um, ah, Gosh, I'm, my words are escaping me today. Uh, the um, Rudolf Steiner, who created those schools, the, the Steiner schools, and also was an incredible mystic, uh, occultist, you know, wrote all these amazing books of nature. And he actually did many, many lectures on the Kalevala and even wrote a book on the Kalevala. So uh, these were all those, uh, how did I get into all this? Sorry. You, you have to interrupt me, my dear, because otherwise I can talk on my own forever and go into all sorts of directions. Oh yeah, it was a mystical trip. Yeah, the mystical trip. So I brought people to Finland and I have another mystical trip into Finland coming up in, uh, when is it, in August of 2021. And then, uh, and that opened the door to other places I was excited about that I wanted to share with my my groups and my my the people around me so bosnia of course is amazing because who knew that there were huge pyramids in europe of all places uh that nobody had um, had discovered until or rediscovered until very recently and those pyramids are very pure because not many people have been there and the tunnels have an incredible power and and they have been measured um, in terms of their frequency and they create incredible healing in people and um so that's um and there's more coming that uh, there's egypt of course because the pyramids have always fascinated me and that i think there's so much to be gained especially at this time where the world needs so much healing that we need to heal ourselves to heal the world and that's the that's the premise and uh, pyramids are incredible places that enhance our natural healing abilities and connect us with some profound pr profound mysteries and truths of our own history um i can see that i can see your necklace you know representing egypt the, the beautiful necklace yes. that you yeah. Well, actually, this is uh, the um, this is the ankh, but this is the original ankh coming from Atlantis. Oh wow! Uh, the original ankh wow. had was a circle, was not an eye, and it has uh, maybe you can't see it very well, but it has like three little fingers on each side. So that is the circle of eternity. That is past, present, future, the horizontal arm, and the vertical arm is incarnation. So, mm -hmm. and it also connects to nine. If you look at numerology, so it's three fingers, three fingers, three fingers, which corresponds to the three worlds uh, in the underworld, the middle world, the upper world. Uh, people connect that to unconscious, conscious, subconscious, which I don't quite relate to because in shamanism, we really go places when we go in the underworld we go to the to the um, 
I think it's the inner earth. That's really what I see there. You know, there is like rivers and there's mountains and there's all sorts of things in the inner earth and as well as in the underworld. And the middle world is where we are now. And the upper world is, as I said earlier, you know, the place of the mystics, the, where people go when they die, um, according to the carols, and where we meet our future and, and all those things. So, so this ang for me is very profound because it's also the key of life for the Egyptians. And it is that they would actually, if you look in Egypt, in the, uh, the hieroglyphs that are in all the temples, they were holding the ankh by the circle. So it was like a real a key. And they would direct it. And it was like huge. They were like really big. They were not like a little necklace like this. It was really a big, um, very big. And they would direct it. And through whatever they would direct it towards, would uh, create energy, would create healing, or would resurrect, or, uh, and you see actually, uh, if you look closely at uh, the um, at, uh, uh, details of uh, hieroglyphs in uh, the temples in Egypt, you can see also characters that are surrounded by a, a sort of necklace of angst all around them. And sometimes the ink is directed to the, the floor, to the ground. Sometimes it's directed to a person. Sometimes um, it's directed uh, to the sky. So there is a lot of um, mystery and magic connected to the ink. And also that's a protection. Like if you put yourself, because it also represents a human, you know, the, the head and the arms and the incarnation. If you imagine yourself, uh, that's a very good practice, even if you're not wearing an egg, but you imagine yourself in an egg. So the, the, the sort of eye of the egg is your head and then your arms and of course your body and your legs. Uh, that is a protection uh, towards, you know, in the world or if you are surrounded by, by difficulties or if you are going to a place where there could be some level of danger, that's a way to create anchoring and protection. When is your next trip to... Sorry? Oh. When is your next trip to Egypt? <laughs> well, Egypt, um, I'm crossing my fingers. It should be, it's at the end of September of this year. Okay. So I really hope that uh, we can make it happen. Bosnia too. Bosnia is at the end of June, mid-June of this year. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see about that one. But if it doesn't happen this year, I'll, I'll postpone it until July of 2021. Bosnia. Mm -hmm. uh, and, all the, and all the information, by the way, can be found on your website with all the mystical journeys that you offer and, and books and services as an astrologer and shamanic, um, um, how do you say, shamanic, how you call it? Sessions, yeah. As a shaman, I offer private sessions, but I also do my school, the Yonkai Muna Yachai School of Shamanic Studies. And the next one is starting in Phoenix in uh, this uh, November, November of 2020. Um, and it's uh, it's a professional school, so it goes through four the four directions: the south, the west, the north, and the east. And in each direction, there are certain rites and initiations that I share. There are uh, healing techniques that I share and, uh, and a lot more. So it's also, even if people are not, some of my students never, you know, graduated, but did not become professional shamans, even though they can, but they just did it for themselves, just to lead a better life. Because the purpose of shamanism is first of all it's a path of power so it's not for the weak uh, minded it's very strong we encounter strong things we do exorcisms without the uh, the drama <laughs> um, but at the same time we work on ourselves because the purpose is to become as transparent as possible you cannot help another or show the way to another if you are full of anger, resentment, frustration, you know, things that you have not resolved within yourself. So 
not to say we're perfect, we're not, nobody is, I'm the first one to not be perfect, but it is about uh, being as transparent as possible because when we are transparent, we can reflect, we can become sacred witnesses, we can honor and receive information in a very innocent, pure manner. Which is actually, um, and, and you have asked me this earlier, um, you know, what are the techniques or what are things we can do to help ourselves? And one thing that I really love is that um, my bedroom is really a sanctuary. There's no TV, there's actually, I don't have TV to begin with anyway, <laughs> um, but no TV, no, um, no phone, no electronics of any, any sort. And just a place for sleeping, love, and meditation. And that's it. Nothing else should happen in your bedroom. So it's not a place to bring your computer. It's not a place to, do, to watch uh, the news, you know, definitely not. And it's important that there is also no mirror. Uh, and if you have a mirror, um, just cover it or get a you know, uh, get um, a curtain that you put in front. So during the day, it's okay, but not at night. And make sure because mirrors reflect the lower astral. And when we reflect the lower astral, all sorts of entities can be watching your sleep. And that's not a healthy thing at all. Um, and try to meditate, try to be in a quiet space before going to sleep and when i say quiet it's almost be like an empty vessel like i'm blessed to have a little balcony and a swinging chair and i just sit under the stars for like 15 minutes before going to sleep and i just empty myself i just think of nothing i just look at the stars i look at the night i i just you know become this empty vessel no thoughts no worry no uh, and it's quite an exercise to be empty you know to not have all these thoughts coming in and out so i don't necessarily meditate in the traditional way you know i see people who sit on a cushion close their eyes and they have all these visions i believe in meditation uh where we um that krishnamurti was talking about the meditation with eyes open where you are focusing on for example the leaf of a tree or a blade of grass or a flower or the you know the uh, flame of a candle and for start with one minute don't have any thought just observe this natural thing in front of you with no thought whatsoever and if you manage to be without any thought for one minute then go to two minutes and to three minutes and to five minutes and until it becomes a way of life you know and now i'm at a point where there's a lot of times during the day where i don't think at all i'm just completely blank empty and those times are very magical times because that's a state you want to be in when you are speaking to someone or when you are especially when i do sessions an astrology session or a shamanic session I'm completely blank before. I don't think of, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to say that, or I have no idea what I'm going to say, which is scary. It's very scary. The same before an interview, it's super scary. I'm, I'm like totally stage fright. <laughs> but eventually. You don't look it's scared at all. What? <laughs> you don't look scared at all. It's like amazing. <laughs> Well, I had stage fright before we started, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I always do. Like, I don't like going on stage. I don't like uh, even, you know, my, my, um, all my groups have been uh, encouraging me to do YouTube and to start putting up videos. I'm like, uh, I've been a little <laughs> dragging my feet on that because, you know, stage fright. But then when you get in the flow, it's, it, it happens and it's, scary because the emptiness is scary we are afraid of the void we are a civilization that's afraid of the void you know if you wherever you go there is noise there's music there is um all these distractions all the time it's like we're afraid of silence and yeah. the only times i really heard silence was in lapland where it's just blank 
you can't even tell what's the difference or the north of Canada. You can't even tell where the difference between the earth and the sky is because it's all white in the winter. White snow, frozen lake, covered with snow and white sky. And that's the only times where you hear silence. And silence has a sound, believe it or not. It's unbelievable. The sound of silence, it's very real. And it's, it's something that is so, even if you are blessed to just listen to silence for one minute or five minutes, it can, it's as relaxing and as empowering and as um, recentering than sleeping, you know, for 10 hours. It's something incredible, silence. And I think that we have so many things nowadays that are taking us away from silence, but that are also disconnecting us from our spiritual core because we can't hear silence, because we're not listening to silence. So, and because we can't, because there's never silence around us. So there are very few pieces on the planet at this point where we can resource ourselves in silence. And those places are absolutely precious and blessed and, and sacred. It, it reminds me a little, like, I feel like sometimes a way to, at least in my case, to, to facilitate myself to a state of what I call more grounded and connected is going from my mind to my senses. Like when I focus more on my senses, it kind of, like through the body, I can feel more connected to everything. But then if you are in the senses, but you don't have to use the senses or you are in that state that everything melts together, it's kind of like even deeper into the whole states that kind of remind me a little bit what you're talking about. That is so beautiful and incredible. So, I love um, that. That's exactly that, you know. Like if we could also, you know, when we are a little frazzled or anxious or nervous, it's also very nice to do this sort of box uh, breathing, you know, that the yogis do to rebalance everything where you breathe in counting to seven, you hold counting to seven, you exhale counting to seven and you keep your lungs empty counting to seven and seven is the magical number in astrology numerology it corresponds to neptune and neptune is a planet that connects us to the unseen to the unknown to the divine the music of life the the music of the spheres uh, the angelic realm so everything connected to neptune is also uh, very very calming and and helps us to see beyond the veil, you know, to start to connect with, with life uh, in all its dimensions and not just this one physical dimension. And it also so, connects us to our dreams. Um, before we move to astrology, because I also would love to see uh, and hear and, you know, um, experience all the wisdom that you have on that too. I have one more question about you regarding shamanism. Could you share with us uh, maybe any kind of like unique experiences that you may have had with the Keros or through shamanic yeah. work? I have many with the Keros. One of the most striking was that, um, you know, for the Keros, waterfalls are very sacred. And I was brought by um, my teacher to this uh, waterfall in Kiaru Miyok, which is the temple of the moon. And there's this beautiful waterfall there. And, um, and all of a sudden, I felt like his hand pushing me under the waterfall. And I had no intention of going under the waterfall. But what happened is that I, I just completely went under the waterfall, pushed by his hand or what I thought was his hand. And I felt not that I was going to die, that I was going to be annihilated from humanity. That's how powerful this was. And then I Sorry. like completely like I would I was going not to die, but I was going to to lose my existence altogether. Completely not exist anymore. Like I not as a soul, not as a body, not as nothing. 
like nothing. And then I guess I, I, I was, you know, I came out and then the hand pushed me back in. And then the same thing happened. And then I got out and then a third time and the same thing happened three times in a row. And when I came out, I realized I was alone. My teacher was not there. He was at the top of the waterfall and there's no way, because this happened very quickly, there's no way he could have been next to me, pushed me three times, and between the time I last came out and, and, and gasped for air, that he was already up there. It was impossible because it took like, a, there's a little path and you have to go all the way up. And I mean, it's, you can't go like that in three seconds unless you fly up there. That's the only way. So it, I don't know if it was, to this day, I still don't know if it was really him pushing me or not. But what happened was that I distinctly felt this hand just gently pushing me there. And after that event, I slept for 15 days, 15 days. And I was in and out of reincarnation. It was the most bizarre thing. It was like I would get up, you know, just to go to the bathroom, drink a glass of water, and I was back and sleeping. And 15 days it lasted. And during those 15 days, it was like I went in and out of all my incarnations. I mean, what I assume are all my incarnations. So at least, I don't know how many I have, but um, it, was, it was quite an experience. And when I came out of those 15 days, I, I just wasn't the same person. Mm. Physically, I had really changed <laughs> in a big way. <laughs> so yeah, these are some of the experiences I've had, but I've had many more. <laughs> We need more interviews. We need more get-togethers. <laughs> Another summit with you. <laughs> I'd love so, that. Okay, so how do we go now from shamanism to astrology? And then both of them, they complement, I believe, according to, you know, they right? Do. They really do, Maite. And I love that you say that because when I, you know, for the longest time, I was just an astrologer. I mean, I was always interested in shamanism. But if you had told me I would become a shaman, I would have said, okay. <laughs> um, but that was not my, my plan. Um, astrology, but astrology led me to understand God, to understand the divine. And, uh, and, and then I realized when I became a shaman that I always did astrology in a shamanic way. Like when I do a personal reading, I travel always in the person's psyche. I see threads of light. I need, you know, we are all, each of us is a crystallization of a moment in time and space, which is our chart, our astrological chart, which is, you know, the uh, blueprint for our lives. It's based on the moment we were born and had our first independent breath. Uh, it's also based, of course, on our date of birth, uh, month, day, year, and um, the time and the place, the location is very important in terms of latitude and longitude. And from there, we calculate what was going on in the sky at that time, where the planets were, how they were in relationship to each other. And that is a map that gives a map that the astrologer reads that enables um, to tell everything about a person. It's pretty wild. You can describe your ideal marriage partner, you could describe your mother, your grandmother, your uncles, your cousins, your father, your siblings, how many siblings you have. Uh, it's incredible what you can tell, what kind of job you are um, best fitted for, uh, what kind of relationship you're best fitted for, what kind of friends you gravitate to, what kind of weaknesses you have, what kind of strengths you have, what kind of um, resources can you draw upon, even how you look physically. That's like incredible. Um, <laughs> like I had one time, I had this, uh, he became a friend later on, but I had this young um, student who, who wrote to me that he wanted a reading and, uh, and my friends, you know, read the letter and they said, oh, um, he looks like he's a small, stocky person. And I said, really? I said, what makes you think that? And it was just a handwriting. 
uh, it was at the time where there were no computers and, and all of that. And anyway, and so he came and, um, and before he came, I said, no, looking at his chart, he's very tall. <laughs> he's very tall and lean. And, uh, and indeed, the guy was like almost two meters high and he's very, very lean, even though he was only 16 years old. So the, you can tell that from the chart, like you can tell if a person has some homosexual tendencies, for example, you can tell, um, you know, if somebody is fit for marriage or not. For example, um, uh, Elizabeth Taylor, who married five times, if I had been her astrologer, I would have said, don't marry because her chart is not one for marriage. You know, her chart is that, I mean, not that she couldn't have relationships, but maybe not legally getting married because that was not what was the best for her. The best would have been to have relationships and, and to, but not legally, not, not being, you know, uh, anchoring it with, a, with all of that. She could have done her own ceremony and, and, uh, and enjoyed that uh, togetherness, but without the notion of marriage. So, you know, we are not all equal. All of us have different strengths and talents. And for example, you know, a person uh, who is very detailed, very organized, are not doing, going to do well in an environment where they have to be super creative. And a person who's super creative is not going to do well in an environment where they have to get to work at nine in the morning and leave at five and be super focused on facts and figures, you know? So, um, Reading our astrological chart is very useful because it helps us be more connected to ourselves and to also know, even though that's not the purpose really of astrology to predict the future, but of course all of us want to know what's going to happen, when is this corona story going to end, when is this, you know, when am I going to get out of this depression? Um, so it's good to know, uh, to have dates and to know that everything functions in cycles because then we don't become desperate. And then instead of trying to go against the grain, we will go with the flow. And there are times, as the Ecclesiastes say, there's a time to weep, there's a time to laugh, there's a time to sow, there's a time to get the rewards, there's a time for everything. And that relates directly to astrology because in astrology there's a time to get married, there's a time to get into a start a new career, there's a time to move, there's a time for all those things. And that's where astrology is pretty amazing in that sense. It's a profound, profound book of wisdom. That's how I've always seen it. So it's very related to shamanism, but I've always, I was always a little uh, frustrated as a shaman, as an astrologer, because you know, I could go so far with people in terms of explaining the cycles, explaining, you know, where they are. So it, it more uh, appeals to the head and to the intellect, but then um, it would sort of stop there. I mean, it's always good to know things. It's always good to understand things, but we need to be able to work on them on an energetic level. And that's when shamanism comes in because as a shaman you work on an energetic level you don't work with the head you work with your heart so and you work uh with with frequencies with energies around you so that was the um, so for me they're so complementary of each other and they bring so much and and i'm so grateful that at this juncture of the evolution of humanity that I have both those tools available uh, to offer because that's really how we can move forward with consciousness and rise those changes with elegance and, and deep understanding. Um, it's like the best of both worlds <laughs> put together that exactly. very nicely. Do you think there is some kind of like percentage or correlate? I mean, or correlation between what is established according to that moment that we were born and how everything is influencing versus us working on the energetic field and making something happen. Like we have the guidance, but also we have a possibility to see stuff and to do stuff. So how do you think is that correlation and how much can we change things according to what is already kind of like established or or is coming 
That's a great question. I'm so glad you're asking me that because there is destiny and there's free will. You know, and a lot of people are like, I don't want to know my child because I don't want to be influenced. Well, it's the opposite because the more you know what influences are and what tools you have, the more free you're going to be. Um, I will give you an example, a very simple example that, for example, we can have, you know, sugar, flour, uh, butter, eggs, you know, all the ingredients to make a cake. And with the same ingredients, one is going to burn their, their little cookies and the other one is going to create a magical, amazing cake. So is it the ingredients a problem or is it the, the consciousness, the know-how, oh, wow. mastery of the cook? I love you know? that. Another. And then another example, I'll give you another example that, for example, as Raji says, it's raining outside and one is going to go uh, say, oh, I'm not going to go out because I don't like getting wet. So I'm going to stay home, have a little cup of hot chocolate, sit by the fire, read a book. The other one is going to say, oh, it's raining outside. Uh, well, I need to go out, I want to go out, so let me get an umbrella, raincoat, and I'm going to go into the rain, but protect it. And the third one is like, cool, it's raining outside, let me just experience the rain, and it's just going to go out and just with no protection whatsoever and experience the rain. So all that Astrology says is it's raining outside, <laughs> that's all it says. And now what you do with that, that is your choice. And that's where free will enters, you know, that's like we, and that's the magic of it. And that's why it's so important to know our chart. It's so important to know where we, who we are and what we, um, what we are made of, what we came with, because there is no bad chart. Um, a chart is just a map, you know, it's a map. That's all it is. And then what do we do with this map? How do we organize our life with this map? It's like, you know, a GPS. I don't know how we lived before the GPS is, you know, <laughs> what we did, we read maps, okay. But now with a GPS, um, you know, you can randomly drive around hoping that you're going to, you know, get to that scenic view, get to that restaurant, get to that thing, or you can map your, your uh, itinerary and say well um i want to see that museum i want to visit that church i want to be on that scenic road uh this part is not so interesting so i'm going to get to take the freeway uh but then i want to to stop at a nice restaurant um and then you plan your trip and you make it more interesting and that's really the purpose of doing an astrological reading is that you're going to make your your path more interesting because you're going to be able to understand it more and then use it to the, the the top of your abilities instead of just randomly living and hoping to get somewhere you know yeah. so yeah. that's that's the magic of astrology <laughs> because it does project us in the future it shows us what is going to happen and then when we go through certain aspects, you know, for example, planets, um, you know, coming together in a certain angular uh, distance, you can look at when it happened in the past, what happened? And then you take lessons from the past and say, okay, this time we're going to deal with this differently. We're going to do something else. We're going to, we know this is the danger. Now we're going to learn and create something else for ourselves. Yes. It sounds like it gives you the chance to have some guidance and, and some, yeah, guidance and then we can decide what to do, have a more clear idea in some way. How did you apply all of this to where we are right now with COVID-19? Like, do you have any, any well, thoughts? That's a great question. And uh, this year, 2020, we have Saturn conjunct Pluto the whole year, pretty much. It started on the 12th of January, but we will we feel it the whole year. And if we go back in time, the last time this happened was in 1914, 1947, and 1982. And of course, those dates correspond to World War One, World War Two and the war in Afghanistan, the Great Depression. But this is not to say that we are now entering World War III, because on top of 
that Saturn Pluto conjunction. So the conjunction is like they are, you know, in the same um, spot in the zodiac. They are, you know, within uh, a few degrees of each other or exact. They were exact on the 12th of January, which is when we started hearing about all this Corona story. Um, we have Jupiter that came in the middle of that, and Jupiter is a keeper of integrity. So it's really what I really feel a tremendous amount of hope for this year because even though we have had the lockdown, even though we have all these restrictions being imposed, even though there's all these fears, because Saturn Pluto, when they come together, they are revealing all our fears, all our insecurities, the lack of safety, uh, everything that was that we tried to hide, and especially the darker, deepest, darker secrets we were trying to hide. And on a global level, these are all the things that have been hidden, you know, the sexual rings, the, the you know, abuse of power, control, the human trafficking, all those horrible things that have been going on for ever, you know, it's not new, it just was hidden, it was not exposed, and now it is being exposed, thanks to Jupiter coming in the middle of that, which is revealing integrity now we have to be in integrity and now we have to also be honest with ourselves not just with others what do we really want in our lives and it's interesting because once certain freedoms are taken away uh, it makes us realize how we took them for granted and it made us realize how we were in the rat race in many ways i mean in june there's six planets retrograde which is enormous and uh, when a planet is retrograde, which is an optical illusion that has meaning in astrology, because it looks like it's going backwards, which of course it isn't, but it's the respective velocities of the different planets that make it look like it's starting to go backwards. And it's always a time to start reflecting on our lives. And in many ways, we, are, we have a huge global, worldwide reset right now you know businesses i mean nothing is going to be ever the same we are not going to go back to the way normality was in the past this is we're going to the new normal you know like this interview this summit i mean the normal old times just a few months ago we would have all gathered in a you know you would have rented a huge hall we would all have gathered there on stage uh, there would have been people in the audience now we're doing it from your home and my home to all everybody who's going to listen to this video's home um so it's much more intimate in a certain way um and it's also more personal in a certain way and uh, maybe we don't need to rent big halls and big rooms and offices and all that anymore maybe now we have found a way where we can work and continue without having to do those things so this is really a very i see it as a very hopeful time that it's a time where we can ask ourselves the true questions and it's also the year of the golden rat in the, in the year of the golden rat in chinese astrology we have to ask ourselves what makes me happy what is what is it that um makes my life peaceful what because the ultimate, you know, I, I hear this all the time in readings. People are like, what is my mission in life? Well, and they always hope to hear that it's to be like on stage and talk to millions of people and write a best-selling book and be super famous and super rich. Well, maybe our highest destiny is just to be happy. That's it. It's as simple as that. And if we manage to be happy, then we've succeeded. We have gained a life a very, very valuable life and that's all that's necessary and it's not about writing books and talking to millions of people maybe it's just being happy that's it <laughs> and i think now this saturn conjunct pluto conjunct jupiter this whole year is about that what makes me happy what can i you know what is the darkest the fears that i have and how can i face those fears and um and then dissolve those fears because i face them because those things i'm embarrassed about i have to face them so that they will disappear whatever we face disappears you know when we are in our dreams and we face a monster 
the monster is not there anymore. And, uh, and now I think that medias and everything, the situation in the world is creating a lot of fear, but I don't know if it's really creating fear or if it's bringing to the surface a fear people had. And that this is the chance for us to say, screw this fear. We don't need to be in fear. There's only two emotions, fear or love. How about we start being in our hearts, being in a loving, being loving. That's all there is to it. And once we are in our hearts, once we are in peace, once we are in our love, then what, what is it that we can fear? We're going to die? We're going to die. All of us are going to die. One day, we're all going to die. So that's a guarantee of life. We are going to die. Um, so let's make the journey a happy one. Uh, let's make the journey one of joy uh, where we we'll start to laugh a little more. You know, children laugh 40 times a day. <laughs> and I think as an adult, we should continue laughing 40 times a day. We should find opportunities to do that. We should wake up in the morning thinking, what am I going to create today? Instead of, oh, I have all these ugh, responsibilities, obligations. And of course we do have those. We have to do these things, but we don't need to limit our life and our journey to those obligations. And we can have a different attitude towards them and say, well, that's great, you know, I have to do that, but it's allowing me to get money, it's allowing me to do other things that are exciting to me, and, and life keeps going, you know? Ah, oh. Long answer. <laughs> that was a long answer to your question. Ah, oh. <laughs> So yes, we do have free will, absolutely. I think the big, big, big elements of our lives are written. We chose them before we incarnated and we chose them based on our past lives and what we understood, what we didn't. But we also come with the possibility of mixing, matching, shifting, understanding it better, using it better, doing other things with that. So we're not stuck in stone. Thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> it's always a good reminder to hear it from someone else and, and, to, and to realize that that's the case. So thank you so much for that reminder. You know, it's, it's very important for all of us. Um, I, I would love to keep talking to you for the entire day. <laughs> um, I'm calling you tomorrow, I'm past tomorrow. Like, I, I love... <laughs> you're sharing uh, but we're going to have to start I guess getting into the end of this interview or the new, new beginning I guess you know like it's always a new way how, how we how we the, the emotion and the feeling that we put into it um, one of the things that we were talking before we started with the interview I think uh, we were talking about maybe some tips that you would like to share but I already feel like you share so many for like to help us in some way to navigate through life or like uh, things that can help us to to seek into that attitude so if you have any other thing that you would like to to share with us you are welcome uh, but I also want to be respectful of your and I believe bless you Sorry. I don't know <laughs> and you have also you would like to offer uh, some kind of a gift for for the audience so maybe you can tell us a little more about that and also how to find you and we will also of course we will post some information about your website but yeah please go ahead thank you thank you matey yeah i uh, i was trying to grab my bottle i have my bottle with crystals inside um that's one of the wonderful things you can enhance the um the power of the water you drink is to put crystals. So this one is ready made like this and there's a lot of companies to do that. But you can also just put crystals in a pitcher of water and just put crystals at the bottom and drink that water, not the crystals obviously, <laughs> but uh, drink the water because that's going to enhance the quality of the water and water is so precious right now. We need to drink as much water as we can. That's the first thing I do in the morning when I wake up, I try to recollect my dreams and second thing and write whatever I remember. And second thing, I drink water. That's always the way I start my day. Um, so yeah, so the gift, um, if anybody wants to, uh, I mean, all my sessions, what I do is on my website. 
michellekaren.com, my name. And uh, I offer, uh, so if you listen to this interview, just write to me that you listen to this interview. And when you book a one hour session, either shamanic or astrology, I will send you the write up, uh, the written write up of your natal chart. So that's, what, that's my gift. It's about 25 pages. Uh, it's not written by me, it's computerized, but still you will get a lot of information on, on you, who you are, and, uh, and a lot of guidance also on how to navigate your life in a more conscious way. Mm, thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I am thank so honored you. to have you co-creating in this thank summit. And I really appreciate you here. So as the Kiros do, we always say thank you in three. Uh, so good thinking, good heart, good action. So you can see the bottom one, but that's on my stomach. So, mm -hmm. and also the three worlds that we honor. So I honor you. And um, as the Kiros say, Opiche Sonkoi, that's like a little bit like Namaste. It's like the divine in me honors the divine in me. Opiche Sonkoi. Same, same. We'll be in touch. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you.